Turn with me to Revelation 22. As we come to this last section of the book of Revelation, the, the Apostle John will receive some tremendous uh, final revelations from the Lord. He'll be given some final instructions from this unknown angel. Uh, we'll just call him Ralph. Um, I don't know. Uh, he's been like a personal tour guide for the Apostle John. And John will be reminded that everything written in the book of Revelation is faithful and true. And so I always like to ask, is Jesus Christ coming for his bride at any moment? Absolutely. God's word is faithful and true. Is there going to be an unparalleled time of destruction, wrath, judgment from the throne of God? Absolutely. God's word is faithful and true, and it's going to be a seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. Is Jesus Christ going to come back, and we're going to come back with him and rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years? Absolutely. His word is faithful and true. Is Jesus Christ going to create a new heaven and a new earth in which righteous, righteousness will dwell forever and ever? Absolutely, because his word is faithful and true. Are we going to spend eternity with him in glory? Absolutely. And so the, the tour of heaven is over at this point, but now the angel and Jesus have some final thoughts for John, some encouraging, exhorting words for us. So let's pick up in chapter 22, verse 6 is where we left off. It says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. And so as we go through this final section, you'll notice there's a sense of urgency on the part of the Lord. He's wanting to exhort us, be ready, be watching. And we see this throughout, you know, the word of God. We see Jesus especially telling us in the Gospels, be watching, be ready. Time is running out. The clock is ticking. Once the rapture of the church takes place, all these things we've read about in chapter 6 through 18 are going to come upon this world, and it's going to be brutal during that seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. I don't pretend to know everything about this final book of the Bible, but we can certainly believe by faith that everything written is going to take place just as God says it will. This is God's final revelation of His only begotten Son. I believe that everything in this book will be more extreme than we could even comprehend. In other words, His judgment and wrath, as horrible as it has been as we've gone through those chapters, it's going to be worse than we can imagine. But the glory of being with Jesus in heaven is going to be more glorious than we could ever imagine. It's going to be awesome. Notice also it says here in verse 6, it mentions the things which must shortly take place. Now back in chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse, it says these things must shortly take place. The Greek phrase is N-E-N tekai, which is where we get the word for tachometer. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, even though it could, but it means that when it starts to happen, it's going to happen very fast, very quickly. Uh, it's just like when you rev up your engine, the tachometer measures your RPM. It jumps, it goes fast. So when these things begin, once the rapture takes place, then the Great Tribulation will begin shortly after, and it's going to happen fast, seven years. And it's going to be brutal during this time on planet Earth. And so he reminds them these things will happen quickly. So be watching, be ready. We're living in exciting times. I mean, we are, I believe, in the last days. Um, two weeks ago, Israel celebrated its 75th birthday as a nation, 1948. That's when they came back into the land, as God promised he would in the last days, 1967. They reestablished New uh, Jerusalem as their, well, it's their capital, even though the world, most of the world doesn't recognize it. Only our nation right now, and I think one other nation recognizes is, uh, Jerusalem as the capital. But that took place in 1967. Uh, we see a move very quickly towards a cashless society. Everything's becoming digital. 
I mean, there's many places you go now and you can't even use cash. They won't even accept it. And, and so we see things happening very quickly. You know, we talked about um, the ability in the world now, you can track every single human being in the world through satellite, through your little device that you can't put down. Yeah, Martha's got hers. <laughs> I've got mine right there. They know exactly where we are. Um, what we're doing, I mean, it's crazy, but they can track every human being. They can number every human being, which we know will happen when the rapture takes place, and then everybody receives that mark of the beast, the 666. So times are approaching for the soon coming of Jesus for his bride. You know, the, the capability, and this has been like 30 plus years, they say the world can blow itself up with all the nuclear weapons in the world, six times over. I mean, that's just crazy. And, you know, it'll happen. I mean, during the Battle of Armageddon, this world will be on the brink of annihilation until Jesus returns. We've talked about a growing apostasy in the church. Uh, many churches refuse to teach God's word anymore. They don't want to be divisive, and so they don't talk about biblical doctrines. And we're seeing this happening throughout the world. In the last days, we're told that most of the world will turn its back on Israel. We're seeing that more and more. And Jerusalem, as Zechariah says, will become a cup of trembling to the nations of the world. During the Great Tribulation, every nation will turn against Israel, and God will judge every nation at that time. So Jesus tells us, look at this verse in Luke 21, verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen... And it's, been, it's beginning to happen, right? Look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. And that's what we see here. Time is short. Uh, we're living in the time, as some of you uh, moms know, Braxton Hicks contractions. You know, Jesus calls it the, the time of um, uh, the beginning of sorrows or birth pangs. So when these things happen, we know that the clock is ticking and things are coming down the pike really, really quick. So with that in mind, Jesus now speaks out in verse 7. How do I know it's Jesus? Because I got red letters. <laughs> well, no, we'll see. This is Jesus. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Again, he reminds us he's coming for his bride. Quickly, how quick? First uh, Thessalonians 5, no, First Corinthians 15, verse 52 tells us how quick in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So when Jesus comes for his bride at the rapture, it's in a flash. In the, mo the twinkling of an eye, I don't even know what that is. Somebody tried to say it's one fiftieth of a second. How do you measure it? I don't know. It's going to be quick. There'll be no changing your mind. There'll be no, once the rapture happens, nobody on earth will be able to say, wait, I changed my mind. It's too late. They'll be left behind. Notice that Jesus says, we will be blessed if we keep the words of the prophecy of this book. In other words, if we continue to live our lives with that great expectation that Jesus Christ could come back for us at any moment. That's the imminent return of Christ. That's a doctrine that we believe. Jesus could come for us at any moment. He comes for individual Christians at any moment. But he also comes for his bride at any moment. We need to be ready. We need to be watching. We need to keep our focus on Jesus. And that's, to me, the great thing about the imminent return of Christ is that we're living our lives for him, knowing that we, we could have the rest of our lives to live out, but also knowing that he could come today. So I want to be walking in the Spirit. I want to be shining the light. I want to be salt. I want to proclaim the gospel to the people he brings into my life. So that should motivate us to tell people the good news about Jesus Christ. We'll want to see people saved for eternity. Paul summarizes this, this whole concept of watching and waiting while we're living in this world, in Titus 2.11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness 
and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So that's how we should be living right now. But at the same time, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And so what a difference it makes in our outlook on life if we keep our focus on Jesus. We keep looking up while we're looking around. We don't want to just keep our eyes in the sky, but we want to keep our eyes on Jesus and the things he has for us even now. Well, look at verse 8. It says, Now I, John, so here the Apostle John, you know, inserts himself in, in this, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So this is the second time the Apostle John is so overwhelmed by just the things he's seeing and hearing that he falls down before this angel and he begins to worship this angel. And we saw it back in chapter 19, verse 10. The angel then and now quickly corrects him and says, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant. I'm a created being. I'm just like you, John. There's only one who deserves to be worshipped, and that is God. The Bible is very clear. No created being should ever be worshipped. This is one of the reasons why we believe Jesus Christ is God come in human flesh, because we worship Jesus. We bow down before him. Jesus receives worship. We see this throughout the Gospels. Um, and speaking of the incarnation, when God became man, Jesus, uh, when he was born, Hebrews 1, 6, look at this verse, says, But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. So all the angels worship Jesus. Many times in the Gospels, we read about people coming to Jesus, and they would worship him. They didn't just bow down and give respect or obeisance to him, but they literally worshiped him, and he received their worship. A great example is in John chapter 9. Uh, Jesus heals the man that was born blind, and eventually Jesus asked him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And here's the response, John 9, verses 36 to 38. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And so again, only God deserves to be worshipped. So only God is worthy to be worshipped. And again, there's many examples in the Gospels of Jesus being worshipped. Now, what encourages me about this is seeing that the Apostle John blows it big time. He does. He sins. Why do I get excited about that? Because I blow it big time. He twice bows down before this angel and is quickly rebuked for doing it. I've blown it more than twice, and I'm sure many of you have blown it more than twice, and God will gently rebuke us and say, no, don't do that. I've got a better plan for you. I've got more important things for you to do. Start doing it my way and not the way of the world. I mean, so often, especially with, you know, the people we read about in the Bible, apostles, we like to put them on a big pedestal. You know, some churches will almost worship the saints or pray to the saints. No, he's a created being. John is a man of flesh and blood blood just like us the apostle paul remember when he goes into lystra the guy you know is there and, and he heals the guy and the, the whole crowd wants to worship and sacrifice to paul and barnabas what does paul say no no don't do that we are men of like nature as you in other words we're just human beings like you we're not perfect only god is perfect only god is worthy to be worshiped now, we can certainly admire and respect the, the men and women that God uses and blesses, 
But the bottom line is only the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are perfect. Only God is worthy of praise and glory and honor. So here we see John is gently rebuked by this angel. Look at verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now, when we started the book of Revelation, we saw that this is the unveiling, the revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, we saw that there is a built-in blessing for all those who read and hear and heed the things written in this book. So hopefully you're being blessed just as we go through this together week after week. When you read it on your own, hopefully you're receiving that blessing God has for you. So John was told, do not seal the words of this prophecy, for the time is at hand. In other words, we need to know these things because we're living in the last days. And unfortunately, as I mentioned before, there's so many churches that refuse to teach the book of Revelation. I've talked to pastors and they'll say, no, no, it's a closed book. We shouldn't even bother to read it. It's too confusing. It's too... Are you kidding me? This is God's revelation of Jesus Christ. Why would you not teach the book of Revelation? It's sealed no longer. It's never been sealed. It says here, it's don't seal it up. Some pastors will look at Daniel because in the Old Testament book of Daniel, Daniel is told by the angel Gabriel, seal it up until the last days. Look at these verses in Daniel 8, 26. This is Gabriel speaking, says the visions uh, and the visions of the evening, evenings and mornings, which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision for it refers to many days in the future. Well, we're many days in the future. Daniel 12, verse 9. And he said, go your way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Guess what? We are living in the time of the end. And so that future is now upon us. We have all of God's word from Genesis to Revelation open to us. And so we need to open up God's word, spend time studying it, exploring it, allowing the Holy Spirit to draw us closer to Jesus as we feed upon the truth of God's word. So it's not sealed, but these words are open to us. Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Well, if it's been at hand in John's day, that means 1900 years later, almost 2000 years later, it's not sealed to us either. Look at verse 11. Interesting phraseology here. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. The meaning of this is really simple. It just means after reading this glorious prophecy about Jesus Christ and what he's going to do in the future, if going through this doesn't change your perspective on God and on the fact this world will be judged and that there is life after death, and there is a new heaven and earth that he's going to create for us. If you're not convinced of these things after going through the book of Revelation, then what in the world is going to convince you? I mean, if you're still saying, oh, I don't believe any of this stuff, well, you're going to be unjust still. If you say, this is just a bunch of hooey, this is just made up by man, then he was filthy, let him be filthy still. You're just going to live like the world anyway. But for all of us who do believe we should be more convinced than ever that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And so the exhortation to us here in verse 11 is, stay righteous. Keep walking on the path that he's laid out before us. Keep walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you can live a holy life. Because the trumpet is going to sound at any moment. And we're going to be caught up into his presence. And then everything in this book is going to quickly unfold before us. So... I hope you're convinced that this is God's word and it's going to happen exactly as God says it's going to happen. Now look at verse 12, Jesus speaking again, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me 
to give to everyone according to his work. Now, this is the second of three times that Jesus tells us he is coming quickly. He wants all of his saints in every generation to be watching, to be ready, because he could come for his bride at any moment. Notice he says, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work, singular, not works. The bottom line when it comes to works is, and what it, your, he says your works will determine where you are, heaven or hell. When it comes to where you're going to spend eternity, Paul calls it the work of faith. It's not doing good works to earn salvation. Remember when the people wanted to know, how can we work the works of God? In other words, what do we got to work at to make it to heaven? How do I earn salvation? That's what they were asking Jesus. This is what we read in John 6, 28. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is, notice, the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And so, again, you trust in Christ alone for your salvation. You can call it a work, but it's not any work that we do. Even the faith we have to believe in Him is a gift from God to us. So we just need to put our faith in Him. Stop putting your faith in our government. Stop putting your faith in Donald Trump or Joe Biden or whoever else is out there. Our faith needs to be in Jesus Christ alone then once you are a new creation in Christ, we will all be rewarded by Jesus for the works that we do in the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked about this at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. When we're raptured, we go, all of the believers go before the Bema seat and we'll be rewarded for the things we did in the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet the things I've done in my own flesh as a Christian, it gets burned up as hay, wood, and stubble. Very simple. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 14, if anyone's work, which he has built on it, the foundation of Jesus, it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Any good work I've ever done, it's only in the power of the Holy Spirit, where I've denied myself, taken up my cross, and letting Jesus work in me and through me. But everything I do, when I say, I'm going to try harder to do this or do that, then that's just hay, wood, and stubble. You need to learn to surrender to the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit work in you and through you. So verse 13, Jesus is still speaking, a very important verse, I am. And we'll see where that title, I am, comes from. Oh, by the way, the next book we're going to after this, Lord willing, is Exodus. So we'll be in Exodus next week. There's a lot of things, because we're talking about our spiritual exodus here. And we're going to talk about the exodus of Israel from slavery, bondage in Egypt. But there's a lot of parallels. Anyway, here Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So here Jesus emphatically states that he is God. That's why this verse is so important. This is one of those verses where you can say, this proves Jesus Christ is God. There's a lot of groups out there, a lot of cults. Oh, he never claimed to be God. I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end, the first and the last. Look at these verses. These are all titles for God. Isaiah 44, 6. This is a powerful declaration. And guess who speaks in this verse? The Father and the Son in the Old Testament. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. In other words, who's the King? The King of kings is Jesus. Who's the Lord? The Lord of lords, that's Jesus. Who's the Redeemer? Jesus. He's the only one that paid the price for our sins. Now, the Alpha and the Omega, that's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. 
And in any language, when you start arranging the letters in a particular order, they will spell out words that are then able to communicate thoughts and ideas. That's what languages are for. That's what the alphabet is for. So he says, I am the alpha and the omega. For us, we'd say Jesus is the A to Z. So you take all these letters from A to Z. And in English, you pull down certain letters. And what do you spell? Redeemer. Pull some other letters down. What do you spell? King of kings, Lord of lords. Pull some other letters down. Great physician. Lamb of God. Alpha and Omega. I mean, beginning and end. Pull some more letters down. And you have, you know, the chief shepherd. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so Jesus is not only the living word of God, you might say he's the living alphabet of God because these words communicate to us from God's word who Jesus Christ is, that he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end. He is God come in human flesh. And so as you are reading the living word of God, you'll hear Jesus say things like, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. His word says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. All who will come to me, I'll by no means cast out. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So as you go through God's word, ask, Lord, what are you telling me from your word today? Because he will speak to you from his word, the living word of God. Well, look at verses 14 and 15. He says, first, there's a blessing. Verse 14, blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So first we see a blessing. What does it mean to do his commandments? Again, the only thing we can do is believe. You put your faith alone in Christ alone. That's all you can do for salvation. In John 17, verse 3, Jesus said this. He's praying to the Father, and, and it says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's what eternal life is, that you might know him. Now, you're only going to trust somebody that you know. If you don't really know him, you don't really trust him. You meet a stranger and you're kind of like, eh, I'm not going to tell this guy you know, everything about me. I'm not going to give this guy my social security number. I don't trust him. But when you get to know somebody, then you can trust them. Same thing with the Lord. This is eternal life that they may know you. The more you grow in your understanding of his grace, his goodness, his love for you, the more you're going to trust Jesus with every aspect of your life. Our believing in Jesus, our trust in him, it's got to be rooted in our love for the Lord. Remember when the lawyer asked Jesus a very important question, Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40. He said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? It's similar to the other question. What do we got to do? What commandments do we got to keep to make it to heaven? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Apostle Paul will say in Galatians that love is a fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And that's what Jesus is saying here. You walk in love, and it's got to be the Holy Spirit producing the fruit of the spirit of love. That's the only way we can love others. That's the only way we can love God. The Holy Spirit putting that love in our hearts for the Lord. Jesus would go on to tell his disciples in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you. When I see the word commandment, I'm like, oh, no, he's going to command me to do something. Well, sort of, but he says a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. And that's impossible because he says, as I have loved you. My commandment is, you love others. 
Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wife just as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. I can't do that either. How am I going to love Elizabeth just as God loves me, just as Jesus loves me? That's impossible unless I am filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit of love. Don't think you got to try harder and I'm going to love my wife more. No, you need to deny yourself. Die harder to your flesh and let the Holy Spirit work in you and through you, and then you can genuinely love your spouse the way Jesus loves you. Then you can genuinely love others around you the way Jesus loves you. So genuine faith in the Lord is based on genuine love for the Lord and for one another. And we have shown our love for Jesus by believing in Him, by receiving Him into our lives as our Lord and Savior. So what a blessing it is for all of us who are clean and forgiven of all of our sins. Here he says we're going to be able to drink from the river of life. We're going to be able to eat from the tree of life. We're going to be able to come and go out of the new Jerusalem, our holy city. So that's the blessing. Now look at those who reject Christ. They are cursed. They have no entrance into glory. Verse 15, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. That word practices is very important because when you read 1 John, it says, you know, no one who is, you know, born again practices sin. You know, we don't practice these things because now we're a new creation. You know, we still stumble, we still fall short, but we're not a practicing lifestyle of living in rebellion against God because we are a new creation. If you are still practicing sin, you're doing the same sin over and over and over and over again, and there's no remorse, there's no brokenness, you better look in the mirror and say, am I really saved? But if there's brokenness, if there's remorse, if there's humility, praise the Lord. Because the Holy Spirit will not allow you to be comfortable living in your sin. And if you are comfortable living in sin, then you might not be saved. And so here he says, all these are outside. Now, they're, now when we're in New Jerusalem, they're not on the other side of the gate, like trying to get in. And he's talking about those who are dogs. They're not coming in. Now, the word dogs doesn't refer to those who are outside, like barking. Don't think like, well, little Fido, he's outside the gates. That's not what he's referring to. He's referring to those who are twisting God's word. The word dogs in the New Testament is used of those who try to justify themselves before the Lord. They're trying to make themselves righteous by keeping good works. Um, Philippians 3, verse 2. Look at this verse. Paul says, Of the legalistic Judaizers, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. In other words, watch out for those who say Jesus did not do enough for your salvation. Watch out for those who say, well, Jesus is good, but you need to do all this other stuff. They're Judaizers, they're dogs, Paul says. The Judaizers were those Jews who s sort of came to Jesus, but then they said, well, Jesus isn't really enough. And that's when you had the first church council there in Acts chapter 15. Because there were guys following Paul who was primarily winning all these Gentiles into the kingdom of God. And what did they do for salvation? Believe in Jesus. That's all they did. No outward anything. Just believe in Jesus and you're saved. And then these Jews that kind of got saved, they came and said, well, you guys aren't really saved unless you get circumcised according to the law of Moses. So they're adding to the word of God as far as God's grace is. You've got to do these outward things, and then maybe God will save you. Paul says, you're dogs. And when he says there, put that back up, Philippians 3, 2. Beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. He's talking about circumcision. Beware of those who are going to say, you have to do this in order to be saved. You have to keep the Sabbath in order to be saved. No, Jesus is our Sabbath rest. He fulfilled all the law and prophets. So everything's been fulfilled in my life. And so if you insist on saying you're not really saved because you don't worship on Saturday, that's a Judaizer. Beware of the mutilation. Beware of those who say, well, you're not really saved unless you get circumcised. Paul will go on to say, it cracks me up because he goes on to say, well, if you think circumcision will save you, why don't you just go all the way and castrate yourself? Think of that. 
He's, he's not pulling any punches there. You think circumcision is going to get you into heaven? Try castrating yourself and see if that helps. Then you got a front row seat. No, you, you're going to be in pain. That, but that's Judaizers. That's the legalists. Those who are trying to say Jesus didn't do enough. I got to fill in the gaps that Jesus didn't do. No, God's grace is sufficient. Notice it also says that heaven is not for those who practice sorcery or who are sexually immoral, those who continue to murder, who worship anything but the one true God, those who love to lie. Those things have no place in heaven, and they certainly should have no place in your life today as a believer. You need to repent if you're doing anything that's not right with God. Now, before Jesus saved us, we may have been on this list. I'm, I'm on that list. In fact, Paul has like three different places where he has lists of those who do these things, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm on every one of those lists. I'm sure most of you are too. Let me look at the, let's look at my favorite list. <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 9. Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Ding, ding, I was unrighteous. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. And again, I was, I'm on that list, but here's the good news. But... You were washed. We were washed by the blood of the Lamb. You can't get any cleaner than that. But you were sanctified, set apart for God's exclusive purposes. But you were justified. That means God now sees you in Christ, and because Christ is in you, He sees you just uh, justified, just as if you'd never sinned. Can you imagine the Father looking down at your life right now as a believer and say, you're holy, you're complete, because I see Jesus in you but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And that is what it means to be a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So again, how amazingly blessed we are to be in Christ. But don't think I'm perfect. Well, I, you, already don't, you don't think that anyway. But I'm perfect. But don't think of yourself as being perfect, because I know that too. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect but Jesus. We're still in process. We're still in that sanctification process. Well, look at verse 16. Jesus speaking again. This You don't even need red letters for this one. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So again, he first of all validates the entire book of Revelation. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. Again, this is why we do not seal up the book of Revelation. Jesus tells us that these things have been written to the churches. That's for you and me. We're part of the church today. This revelation is for all believers. It's also worth noting that this is the first mention of churches since chapters 2 and 3. Where was the church through the Great Tribulation, chapters 6 through 18? In heaven. God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 Romans 5.9 Much more than now having been justified by His blood, I shall be saved from wrath through him. So chapter 6 to 18, where are we? We're in glory with the Lord. So now we hear the church mentioned once again. Here's the important part of this verse, though. Jesus says here, I am the root and the offspring of David. This is another declaration concerning his deity. This is Jesus saying, I am the root of David. What does that mean? What comes from the root? Well, the tree, the branches, the fruit. So I'm the root. David's out here. He's one of the fruit. So Jesus is saying, I am God. I brought forth David. But he's also saying, I am the offspring, right? I am 
the root and the offspring of David. That speaks of his incarnation because Jesus was born a thousand years later or so from the lineage of David. So he's the, both the beginning before David and he's after David. He's God and he also is God come in human flesh. We see this same thing mentioned in Matthew 22 when the Jews were trying to trip him up and Jesus demonstrating he's fully God, fully man. In Matthew twenty-two forty-one, 41, it says, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. So, I mean, that was the common knowledge. Yeah, the Messiah. We're waiting for the Messiah. He's the son of David. And they're right on that part. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? So he's saying the same thing. I'm the Lord over David, but I'm also the descendant from David. And then it says, And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. And that was because they knew the obvious answer to Jesus' question is, you are the root and the offspring of David, and they would not do that. They refuse to acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. How is a person saved? By believing Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus also says here, I'm the bright and morning star, the brightest star that shines as the sun is about to come up. In other words, Jesus is shining bright even though this world is still in darkness. Verse 17 I love this verse. It says, In the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and the bride, who's that? That's us. Say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. This is like one final appeal for the lost and hurting, downcast person to come to the fountain of the water of life. Come and find forgiveness. Come and be saved. Come and let Jesus satisfy your thirsty soul. And notice who it is that is giving this invitation, the Spirit and the Bride. Jesus tells us the Holy Spirit would come into this world to bring conviction of sin, righteousness, judgment. John 16, verse 8. But here we see the Bride, you and me, it's the Holy Spirit working in us and through us, telling people. We're the spokespeople for God today, telling people, come to Jesus. That's what the gospel is all about, proclaiming the good news. Jesus Christ loves you. How do I know? Because he died on the cross for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. What does that mean? Well, now he's alive, risen from the dead, and he can, he's offering you, come to Jesus and you'll be forgiven. Come to Jesus, and he'll set you free from all the sins you've ever committed. Come to Jesus, and he'll make you a new creation in Christ. And so what a privilege we have in these last days to testify that you can come to Jesus by faith, and he will save you. We are the ones who are saying to the poor, the blind, the brokenhearted, the captive people, come to Jesus and receive God's forgiveness Receive God's salvation. Receive God's love. He alone paid the price that you can never pay. Notice that it says, Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So that's an open invitation to receive Jesus for salvation. He alone can give you eternal life. Whoever desires... Religion cannot save you. Good works cannot save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. He's the only one that can set you free. He's the only one that paid the price in full, and that was his blood shed on the cross for your sins. Notice also that this invitation to come to Jesus is offered to those who are thirsty. Do you have a thirst for God? Do you want to know who God is? Do you have a thirst for eternal things? Only Jesus can satisfy a thirsty soul. Only Jesus has the answers to life's most important questions. You know, where did I come from? Where am I going? 
What is life all about? Are you thirsty for truth? Then come to Jesus. Notice the last part of verse 17. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. All the religions of the world can be summed up with the idea that we must bring something to whatever God is out there and try to appease him of his wrath and judgment. That's what religion does. We got to do these things. Maybe God will accept us. Here, it says, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Christianity, it's not a religion, but it's God's desire for a relationship with us. This is why it says, come to him, take from him. It doesn't say, come to him and bring something with you, because we have nothing to bring to God. We come to him broken, sinful, empty. And he says, come to me and I will cleanse you. I will forgive you. I will fill you up. That's what John 3, 16 and 17 is all about. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18 for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy, words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So that's a heavy duty warning. To anyone who adds to the book of Revelation, God will add the plagues of chapters 6 through 18 to you. And if anyone starts to think these prophecies and promises should not be in the book of Revelation, then it says God will take away his part from the book of life, from entering New Jerusalem. A great example of this is in the Garden of Eden. Eve added to the word of God. Remember when the serpent's tempting her and she said, well, the Lord says, you know, we should not eat of this fruit nor taste it, nor touch it, she said. He didn't say anything about touching it, so she adds to the word. Satan comes along and he takes away from the word of God. Oh, surely you won't die. God said, surely you will die. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is for our well-being. It's for our instruction. Everything God's Word tells us is for our edification, exhortation. All Scripture is given by inspiration as profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Holy Spirit communicates His Word to us. This is how we know everything Jesus has done for us. This is how we know God loves us from Genesis to Revelation. His word. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Read it. Believe it. Enjoy it. Hold fast to the promises he's given us. Finally, and I was really hoping the rapture would happen before I finished the book of Revelation. I could drag it out a little long. No. This is like the 15th time I've taught through the book of Revelation, so one of these times. He who testifies, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, this is John responding, Come, Lord Jesus. That's where you get the phrase, Maranatha. I'm coming quickly. Maranatha. Or come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So even at the end of this amazing book, Jesus is saying, be watching, be ready. I'm coming for you quickly. You don't know when your time is up. I mean, individually, he can come for us very quickly. We just had three deaths in the body, so to speak, over the last couple weeks. He's coming quickly. Collectively, he can come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye for the bride of Christ. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. I don't place much confidence in the rulers of this world to make things better, to make this world beautiful, 
I have tremendous confidence in Jesus Christ. And the older I get, the more I look forward to seeing him face to face. I can't wait. It's going to be glorious. I'm looking forward to that day. Ever since he saved a wretch like me 45 years ago, my greatest desire is to live for Jesus while I'm still here. And then when he says it's time to go home, just to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Hopefully that's your desire as well. Until that day when Jesus calls us home, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And when our time is up, may we be able to say, like the Apostle Paul says, this is the last thing I'll put up on the screen, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. For I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And this is what Paul says for all of us. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And that can be translated his first coming and his second coming. Who have loved his appearing. The book of Exodus. 